everyone. So thank you everyone for being with us all day. Thank you to our panelists so far. I think everyone's been having a really, really good day bringing together years and years of research from this community. And it's really great to see that some of the synergies that are coming together. So I was very grateful to be asked by um, CEOs to chair this panel with so many esteemed colleagues. And particularly for the end of the day, I feel like this is quite a good way for us to end the day. I think we've got some really good stuff to share with you today. So we're going to talk about um, from how we move from understanding to mitigation in this panel. And we, we need to really understand what, what mitigation means. We've used that word a lot. It means different things in different contexts and different organizations. But for Defence and for DSTL, where I work, this means that we need to adapt existing processes and technologies, but also influence that developing tech and make sure the right things are coming at the right time and we're taking them on board. So we've touched on some of the solutions that are available today. We've got uh, nature-based solutions, education, uh, cultural behaviours and change, and particularly the, the military strategy as well. This has come out across the day. But we've got a really mixed panel with us here today that are going to discuss the the huge range of these challenges, but also the opportunities for us to move forward with some of the actions that we have and think about how we might want to implement them. We need to move forward past this theoretical conversation into something that defense can kind of grab, take on board and get in motion. So I will introduce each panel, each panelist just before they speak. Um, I know it's, I personally struggle to remember this, this much about names and details. So hopefully this works for you guys as well. Um, and we're gonna start with Dr. Duncan DePledge, who's in the middle here. So Duncan is a lecturer in geopolitics at Loughborough, geopolitics and security, sorry, at Loughborough University, and he's currently the PI for the NetZ Mill Research Project. So Duncan, I'm going to go over to you to give us a little bit of an overview into what's going on in the defence space, please. Brilliant, thank you, sir. How do I control my slides? Yeah. Should probably should have done that. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Sarah, for that introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It really is a, a great pleasure to be here and I, I'm grateful to, to Lindsay and Ellie and Doug and the, the organizers uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ideas that are underpinning the work that I'm doing uh, and uh, then I'll introduce the, the, the Net Zero Militaries Project, uh, which I'm also working on collaboratively collaboratively together with my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tamira Santos, who's at the back of the room there. Um, so the in th terms of thinking about uh, where we are, and, and I, I initially titled this slide, can militaries decarbonize? And then I decided actually, no, that, that, yes, of course they can. It's, it's a question of will they decarbonize? Um, and I think the, the, the first three panels today what they've really demonstrated is that the, the enormous quantity of fossil fuels that are being burned to sustain military capabilities are becoming increasingly difficult to ignore. I think I think we can all agree on that. And I think that that uh, that's being acknowledged by a, a, a broader audience now. And that's a testament to, to the work of many of the people in this room. And what that's doing uh, is, is what it means is that the notion that militaries are somehow exempt or should be exempt from the unfolding energy transition is being tested again and again. And I think increasingly uh, in, in, in Western capitals in particular, we're seeing that, that, that some of that thinking is starting to, to evolve. And so from London to Washington to Brussels, senior military and defense figures have been signaling uh, a clear intent, at least, to sever their reliance on fossil fuels and exploit uh, emerging low carbon solutions to reduce emissions from their states as well as from their military operations. And I think this quote uh, from the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg from the, uh, I think it was at the COP26 summit, really, really captures uh, that, that's, that intent that is coming from very senior levels uh, of, 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 uh, of military commands and defense organizations. Um, and trying to shift the focus onto the idea that, uh, that that in the future militaries are going to have to be powered by something other than than fossil fuels. So why is this happening? Um, 
militaries have been aware of the environmental implications of what they do for decades. I don't think that's anything new. And I think there's been efforts uh, over over decades to, to really try to mitigate some of the environmental impacts that, that, that militaries have. And that's always sort of, I suppose, been badged as this kind of idea of, of greening defense. Um, the idea that the that, that military organizations can somehow be, be more environmentally friendly. And I think that logic uh, very much was extended into the framing of the, how, how militaries should deal with the climate change challenge. And I think at the core of this idea of greening defense, what we're really saying, or what militaries, I think, are, are, are really saying with it is that we will do what we can. But as soon as operational effectiveness uh, is 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 in any way uh, constrained, this will stop, and and we carry on regardless. And I find that you know there's a danger now that as we talk about what the what climate change and the the low carbon energy transition means for the military, that if we keep returning to that kind of logic, we're not really going to progress very far. And if we talk about greening defence, you're really not going to capture much of a military audience um, because quite frankly that's not their job it's not the job of the military to save the environment militaries exist to protect nations from a wide range of threats and i think as the current war in ukraine reminds us when it comes to wars of national survival in particular states are always prepared to absorb high costs whether that's in terms of lives lost, whether that's in terms of money spent, or whether that's in terms of carbon burned. So to suggest that in those circumstances, militaries are going to be thinking about uh, how much carbon they're burning in order to, to, to win the war, well, I think, I think that's a, a deeply problematic thing to, to, to go after. What militaries are talking about and increasingly talking about, and I think this is the way to engage with military organizations, is not so much then greening defense, but how to engage in low carbon or lower carbon operations, or what I've kind of broadly termed low carbon warfare. Although my definition of warfare in that regard is meant to be more expansive and include kind of peacetime operations as well. So it's not limited to war fighting. And behind all of this, behind this idea of low carbon warfare are some acknowledgement are, are some acknowledgements that militaries cannot ignore this unfolding energy transition. And, and, and there are several reasons for this, and none of them are to do with saving the environment, but they're everything to do with the idea that militaries cannot be seen to be dragging their heels. So this is an issue of the military's license to operate. Will societies per permit militaries to continue burning? Um, vast amounts of fossil fuels as, as the rest of society is decarbonizing. It's a reputational issue, which extends into questions of recruitment. So the military people I speak to frequently refer to the fact that as a younger, more climate conscious generation is coming through, mm -hmm. they are now in a battle for talent mm -hmm. because how many of these people will want to come and work for a dirty sector, fossil fuel burning, a, a heavy fossil fuel user? Perhaps not so much when it comes to those who join the military to be on the front line and to drive the tanks and fly the planes and things, but certainly those who could find a similar career to what they do in the military in the civil sector. So there's a battle for talent there, and the, and the, and the military is very conscious of this. Then there's a question about militaries uh, not wanting to be left behind. And I think, I think this has been already mentioned, but, but the idea that they cannot afford to be left behind because of the risk of stranded assets, because if you end up with all this fossil fueled military force, military equipment, um, what guarantee do you have that in 30, 40, 50 years time, you still got the infrastructure and the logistics to actually support the use of that equipment? And there's also questions there about civil military interoperability. So the great example that I hear coming from, uh, coming from the aviation sector is that if all the civilian uh, airports have, uh, have essentially switched away from uh, jet fuel, traditional sources of jet fuel, then military aviation is going to actually struggle to use those airports. Therefore, there'll be fewer uh, landing strips, air bases that the militaries can operate from. So that's just a very simple example of how uh, military operations, the freedom to operate around the world, to have a global posture, are going to be uh, increasingly challenged. 
And so what all of these concerns, I think, combine into is, is an interest and a recognition that green or low carbon solutions can actually be exploited now for, for operational advantage, holding out the prospect that in a low carbon future, it's low carbon militaries that will be able to actually outcompete their, uh, their adversaries if they remained, if the adversaries have remained tethered to fossil fuels. This is the logic that is driving the military thinking. So it's less about saving the environment and it's everything to do about exploiting the low carbon energy transition in order to enable an operational strategic tactical edge in the future. In terms of how we get there, um, some of the review work that we've done in the initial stages of our project has been trying to capture different poss possible pathways. And we've kind of collected these together into the, this idea of the four R's and, and, and other R's may be available. And so some of you might be able to think of it, think of a few more, but, but these are the ones that we're working with at the moment. And, and they capture different dimensions of, of, of how mitigation could actually be approached by the military. So refuel, we've heard a bit about, um, this is really trying to capture the idea of drop-in fuels. So if you can just come up with alternatives to, to, to fossil-based fuels, um, whether that's manufactured hydrocarbons, you know, the sort of synthetic fuels, these kind of things, um, or, or, or some other source, what you can do is you can keep your military equipment as is. And so the implication is that while you're changing the fuel that goes in, the military in 20, 30 years time still looks very much the same as it does today. It's just fueled in a different way. Repowering is trying to capture the idea that if you move away from fuel and think about power systems, suddenly you start moving into, into terrain where no longer do you actually have to design your capability around an internal combustion engine. You might have a different power source at the heart of it. And that could actually unleash different ways of designing it. So maybe maybe your equipment and, and, and your weapons and your platforms actually start to look quite different to what they've done in the past. So in that sense, you end up with a very different looking military, potentially. And alongside that, there's going to be a lot of rethinking going into the doctrine and, 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 and how you're actually going to use that capability, because it's not going to seem so familiar as, as, as a rebuild approach. A third option uh, is to redirect your emissions. So essentially, make your emissions a responsibility of someone else. We've already heard about the, the, the increased use of contractors, for example. So outsourcing is, is a slightly perverse outcome of this, but it would be a viable way to mitigate is actually you get more, you just literally outsource the emissions to private contractors, to allies, potentially even to proxy forces and those sorts of things. Or you could think about carbon sequestration, or you could think about other sources uh, of offsetting. But the, the point is what you are doing is you're asking others to carry the burden. Uh, the, 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 the militaries would otherwise have to. So perhaps there's some creative carbon accounting to be done there. And then finally, review, which I think really captures some of the things that uh, Nita Crawford was speaking to earlier. The, and, 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 and I think what the point here is that, you know, we, we don't just talk about technology. We don't just look for technological fixes for all of this. It's not just about finding new equipment, new sources of fuel. There's actually behavioral change associated with actually thinking through questions about, you know, maybe we actually have to fundamentally review where, when, how, with who, and for what reasons we actually deploy military force. And that then speaks to those bigger questions about what is our strategic posture going to be? Why do we need to think more in terms of strategic restraint, for instance? So big, big questions about what we actually use our military forces and forces for, and when are we prepared to use them? And technology does not provide the answer to those. Those are big societal questions. And I dare say it's not even up to the military to answer those questions. I mean, these actually speak to, to as I say, much bigger societal debates about what the purposes of defense and why we have it. So there may be other pathways to discuss, but I think most are captured by the, these four R's. And I think the, the reality is that, that all four pathways are going to have to be combined in some form or another. There's probably no, no single pathway that's going to get us where we need to go. While refuel and repower offer routes to military innovation and transformation, some combination of review and redirect will be needed to address the emissions that are most difficult design, to design out. So just for the final minute then, um, all of this is essentially feeding into this project that we've, we've designed called Net Zero Militaries, which is an ESRC funded project. 
uh, is so it, we're spending two years with six months in six months into it, two years uh, looking at working with UK Ministry of Defence to to try to understand what the nature of the challenge is and how how UK defence is actually approaching this, what the implications are, what are the the the, the organisational implications as much as the technological implications. And how is this going to essentially shape future military operations? What are, where, where are going to be the, uh, the, the, the the potential blockers for this? What enablers are needed? How are we going to know that that this is actually progressing in any in any useful way? So, so what are actually the indicators of success in five, 10 years time? That the kind of strategic approach that the government has laid out is actually starting to have a material impact on the way defense operates and, and what does then, that then look like? Um, I'll draw my remarks to a close then, but more than happy to take questions and really just to, to invite everyone to, to, to look up the, the Net Zero Militaries project and, and to engage with us. Thank you. Thank you. You made a couple of points there that almost perfectly lead into our next speaker. So I'm going to draw out how great your points were before we move on. Um, I think I think the point that you made about around building engines is a really vital point almost to you, Finley, because it's something that we well to both of our speakers that are in the room because it affects um air and um sea in such a different way to land. It's how instead of building these platforms around an engine, how do we make things plug and play? What does that look like? There's loads of really big questions, and Duncan's work has been really helpful to kind of contextualize this. But our next speaker is Finley Asher, who is the co-founder of Safe Landing. But before Finley founded Safe Landing, he worked in industry, so he has a really technical engineering based um, background. Um, and Finley's been able to provide lots of challenge over the years to some ideas where we've maybe, we've maybe jumped on it before we've understood that it's perhaps not the best thing. So hopefully today Finley's going to provide us with some more kind of helpful context to keep us on the right tracks in, in the aviation sector. Hey everybody, thank you. I'm just going to take a leap out of the other guys so we can stand up. Um, so yeah, I just one thing I was just reflecting on listening to everybody is kind of how unglamorous this work can be. We're talking about really difficult stuff. Often, actually, I find discussing it, I feel like I'm putting myself under threat discussing it. And it's quite brave to engage with the subject matter um, and, and just try and dive in and ask questions that other people aren't asking around this stuff. So thanks for involving me in it and just respect to everybody that works in this area, basically. So I'm Finlay. Um, I'm going to give a bit of a background to myself and my organization. I'm going to take a look at issues we see with aviation decarbonization plans. I'm an aviation worker, tend to look at civil aviation, but a lot of the issues apply to defence. Um, and I'm going to also just kind of discuss how that relates to defence as well. So my background, I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm quite technical. Apologies if the, the pack is a bit technical. I co-founded Safe Landing, which is for climate concerned aviation workers. Um, and yeah, I spent eight years working at Rolls-Royce. This is one of the biggest engineering companies in the UK, um, one of the biggest aircraft engine manufacturers in the world. And I was working in design across a bunch of products in that company. Um, I founded empl an employee sustainability group within the company. Um, after 2018, uh, there was a big increase in public relations and marketing around sustainability um, coming out of my company in the, the industry. I disagreed with a lot of it. I thought it was really dangerous to the planet, but also to our industry uh, and the future of my career. So we thought, let, let's take a critical look at that internally. Um, and then a few years ago, I quit my job um, and decided to get into climate campaigning. Stuck with an aviation focus. Um, Safe Landing is a group for anyone in the aviation sector, pilots, cabin crew, air traffic controllers, airline workers, engineers, anybody that wants to critique what our industry is doing and take action either internally, externally, however you feel comfortable. So please check out our group and give me an email if you want to discuss any of this stuff. So a little bit on our demands, which I think is kind of important. So we want to be really honest about the environmental impact of aviation. Uh, this is often downplayed. We want to be realistic about technology and, and, and how it can solve the problem. We want to be transparent about regulations that our industry tends to lobby against. We want to understand what those policies are coming down the, the track and talk about them as soon as possible. And then finally, we want a plan that accounts for all of that stuff and supports workers through what is going to be quite a transformative time for the industry. So with that in mind, our positions are, we think aviation has a high environmental impact. We just want to say that out loud is currently highly inequitable. It's very unfair how it's distributed. Only a tiny minority of the world fly. Technology won't be available at scale. 
the time horizon we're looking at, 10 to 15 years, nothing. Future regulations are therefore vital. That includes flying less, again, a taboo subject in our industry. We want to talk about it. Acknowledging this and planning for this, we genuinely believe is in everybody's best interest. That includes workers in the sector. This seems scary and a bit dangerous for us discussing it, but actually we think if we deal with this head on, we've got the best chance of survival and of having secure, sustainable employment that lasts for the next 30, 40 years. So I just kind of want, I did this for this conference, but I just kind of thought, how do we think about it? How does the military think and how can we apply this to this problem? So the first thing is risk mitigation. So consider all potential scenarios and threats. Don't ignore things that are uncomfortable. Prepare for the worst. Don't assume the best. Oh, this is a technology. It's definitely going to work. Let's let's bank on it. Have multiple mitigation options in case any of them fail. Just solid military planning, I hope, kind of thinking. Systems thinking as well. Robust requirements capture. Understand how the market, how the world is going to change and account for those. Consider interactions with other systems. We need this fuel, but what does agriculture need? What does shipping need? Don't just look at things in a silo and consider how requirements will change with time as well. Um, it's really important. So just with those things in mind, just taking a look at the first one, so that the kind of change with time, carbon budget is absolutely fundamental here. So how long do we have? Well, um, at the moment, this is what the industry presents. This is civil aviation. Um, we present like, we're gonna get to net zero in 2050. Um, we're going to do that by kind of neutralizing growth in the short term with offsets. Then we're going to bring in some technology efficiency and the big green bit of, of emission savings is from sustainable aviation fuels. So just kind of our critique of this plan is it doesn't matter about 2050. We're going to blow the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees C and potentially lose everything in 10 to 15 years. In fact, even if we basically take all of the highly optimistic assumptions from our industry at face value and assume they're all gonna work, we're gonna blow the budget by two or three times over based on this strategy. Um, and we see big risks in all of those mitigation options as well. So yeah, really we need to get to zero by 2035 and be on a downward trend from now towards then um, over the next decade. The reason for this is the carbon budget. So since the industrial revolution, we've been filling up the atmosphere with CO2. And we've been accelerating how much carbon we put into the atmosphere every year. And we're going to hit a point where we put too much carbon in the atmosphere and we go over the 1.5 degree threshold. We've got less than 10 years at current rate of emissions before we go over that line. So 2030 is important, not 2050. People don't like discussing that. OK, <laughs> so this is an emergency. And um, when we're, you know, we're trained to put safety first as aviation workers, pilots, you're told that if there's a potential threat, even if you don't think it is, you act on it. If there's a warning sign in the cockpit saying there's an engine on fire, you don't just switch it off and say, oh, it's probably just a fault. You stop what you're doing and you deal with that and you come up with different mitigation options. OK, so the next thing is how much low carbon energy and resource do, you, do we have? You might have heard me asking some questions on this. So I think this is a really important point. So just there's a study from the Royal Society earlier this year, current jet fuel supply, no increase. If, you, if we make that from biofuels, from crops, the most efficient way of making that biofuel, we need half of land in the UK, not just farmland, all land. Um, and that's not including military, just to give you an initial perspective on this, and I'm gonna come back to that. Um, so we need to consider the whole system. I won't go into this diagram, but that kind of starts to do it. And this is the systems thinking we need to, to think about. The next thing is price of carbon and how is that going to change with time? Um, so this is just low, medium, high carbon prices um, from the Department of Business and Energy. The jet zero strategy from the UK government doesn't consider this at all. It just assumes the carbon price is going to remain super low over the next 20 years. And we think just that alone is a major requirements capture miss um, from our government. Um, and we should be asking the same questions in defence. This is an economic question. If you decide not to insulate your buildings and apply solar panels and all that sort of thing, it might save you money in the short term ahead of the next election. But in 2030, when the cost of living is massively up again, because we need to phase down subsidies and fossil fuels, you're going to get your hands burnt and you're going to have massive, massive bills on your hands at that point. So we need to be asking the government these questions. I ask this one to leaders all the time um, and they always avoid the question. So this is a Please ask this question. Um, just to show you, this is what the UK government's modeling for international carbon prices. 
It's got low, medium, high. Uh, the red is the high. They don't mount mod. They, they they show it, but they don't model it, and they just go for the medium and the low values. Nowhere near even the bottom of the low estimate for carbon prices from elsewhere in a different government department. Seems pretty dangerous to us. So what's actually happening? Aviation missions are growing. They're growing exponentially. We think um, we're on dangerous trajectory. So we've got a playbook um, the industry uses to justify that growth. Firstly, it plays down the problem. It says it's just 3%. You might have seen some other people today saying 1% of emissions kind of thing. That's a massive amount. It's bigger than many countries. Um, and actually, we're on a growth trajectory because other sectors are going to decarbonize. This doesn't include non-CO2 emissions either, which are massive. They're two thirds of aviation's global warming impact. And we need to consider those as well. I can discuss with you how military um, non-CO2 um, is, is kind of different as well. Um, so, yeah, what we're going to do about it, well, there's four pillars. There's efficiency improvements, zero emissions aircraft, sustainable aviation fuel and offsetting. Efficiency improvements to begin with. What I was working on, I thought I was doing a good thing, making aircraft engines more efficient. Now, fuel burn has been decreasing with time. That's the blue line. However, air traffic growth has been exponential, and that leads to exponential CO2 growth. This is called the rebound effect or Jevons paradox. We've known about it for 200 years, but we still claim that efficiency improvements reduce emissions. They don't. So if we keep on going with the track we're on, we should expect that if we don't limit air traffic, we don't fly less across all sectors, military and civil, emissions will grow regardless of efficiency. So what about electric flight? So basically, this is only viable for small aircraft, small distances, 10 passengers, one hour. It's not going to be able to um, revolutionize how we fly, probably, um, in the military, apart from, from drones. Um, and the big problem is the weight of batteries and electrical systems as well. It's not just the batteries, it's the motors, it's even the cables and aircraft. We're so weight sensitive, this is a big issue. Electrical vertical takeoff and landing, you might have seen this stuff. Um, this is the least efficient electric aircraft going. Um, so uh, yeah, hydrogen flight. Um, the problem with hydrogen is the volume. Um, this is particularly, and, and then you get basically because of that volume of hydrogen, you either have to increase the size of the aircraft, makes it less efficient, or get rid of passengers. Obviously the military equivalent is, is um is army personnel and military equipment and um, but you've got reduced range and payload capability not very good for the military or even get into hydrogen exploding if you're shot at and that sort of thing so i think hydrogen i wouldn't really just for the military i wouldn't go into it potentially for civil but not in the long term not in the short term sorry finally sustainable aviation fuel i'm aware I'm maybe over time but i just want to get into this a little bit so Rather than take fossil fuels out of the ground, um, we combine hydrogen and carbon that we take from the atmosphere. If we power that with renewable electricity, this can seem like a kind of um, circular economy where we're not adding additional carbon to the atmosphere. So biofuels first. Sorry, I'm not there we go. So the problem with biofuels is crop-based biofuels, which are the most prevalent, produce more emissions than fossil fuel. The industry says, well, we're not going to do this. But actually, in the US, there's, where, where the biggest policy is coming through, they're, they're using fuel from crops in there. We've gone and looked at some places in the global south where actually there's big SAF refineries getting built in some of the most deforested areas of the country using soy, using cattle and um, animal fat. So waste, we talk about waste biomass instead. The problem is there is lots of different competing uses for biomass waste, and it's difficult to collect. <clears throat> Um, this is a study showing aviation demand on the right and what we could maybe get from waste biomass on the left. But also we've got to remember whole systems thinking. We're competing with uh, agricultural fertilizer, heating and industry, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, road transport fuels, shipping, bioplastics. And we are not doing the cross-sector analysis here. If we did, we'd say there, there's nothing and we need to direct our, um, our energy somewhere else. And um, just to give you a bit of an understanding here, the right blue line is bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. The red is low, medium and high potential supplies of biomass. And um, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage will use all of that up. Um, and that's where we should be sending it. So electrofuels, final thing. Um, we use renewable electricity to produce hydrogen, to suck carbon out of the air. That produces an e-fuel. Uh, and then we capture the carbon again. The problem with this is energy consumption. So on the right, this is the energy it would take to produce our current jet fuel demand with renewable electricity. 
That would be twice all of our low carbon energy. Actually, it'd be all of the grid or twice our low carbon energy if you include nuclear. It would be four times our wind generation or five times our nuclear. It was massive. Offshore wind, we'd need an area the size of Northern Ireland um, to make enough for civil aviation without growing anything. Um, and I'm going to skip this slide, but it's the worst use of renewable electricity we have. And there's a massive opportunity cost from using it for aviation. Um, finally, offsetting, we know why this doesn't work, but just to quote the CEO of United Airlines, even if we covered the entire planet in trees, that would be five months of emissions, and then we're out of land and we don't have anywhere left to grow food either. Um, so <laughs> let's stop talking about carbon offsetting, it's mathematically doesn't work. That's me. Sorry for going over time. Thank I told you this was an exciting one for the end of the day, didn't I? So we're only halfway through. We've got more to come, guys. So then our next presentation is going to be online. So in a short second, we're going to go over to Dr. Karen Bell, who is a senior lecturer in, in sustainable urban development at the University of Glasgow. So we just heard from Finlay, who's been in industry and then has kind of come back out. But now we're going to be hearing from someone who's kind of on the outside looking in to defence and industry to hear some more of Karen's um, observations and, and how she, the opportunities that she sees for the defence sector in this space. So Karen, we're going to go over to you in a second um, and then our uh, audio will cut. So I'll just give you a little wave when we're swapping back over to you to move to the next speaker. So over to you, Karen. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me OK? Well, hopefully you can. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I had to teach today. So I'm going to um, share my slides. I can't share my slide while another participant is sharing. So um, could you take that slide down, please? Brilliant. Thank you. I just need to um right, okay, hopefully you can see the, the whole screen. So I'm going to talk about again how to decarbonize. Um so this presentation is based on work that I've done on decarbonizing and diversifying defense in the United States and the UK where uh, we interviewed a group of defence workers on um, how they saw the transition happening. Um, so we had uh, 58 interviews and then several expert dialogues with union leaders and um, some defence sector uh, representatives. Um, and it was funded by the British Academy. Okay, so um, basically the research work covered decarbonisation, but also diversification. So um, as Finlay kind of alluded to, um, it's not just about a kind of focus on decarbonisation because then you can, there can be knock-on effects for other environmental problems. And uh, we know that, for example, the critical minerals that are going to be used for um converting to solar and electric vehicles and that kind of thing is going to cause huge uh, problems of contamination uh, from the lithium mining for example the people that live close to that so in this presentation i wanted to just focus on what the work has said specifically about diversification so we can't talk in terms of numbers because we didn't have a big sample it wasn't a survey uh, but there was a a cross section of views. So some people were opposed to all forms of diversification because we'll see in some of the quotes why they why they thought that. And others thought it might be quite a good thing strategically and more or less to keep the defense sector going to diversify. And others wanted an actual scaling back of operations and production because they felt that was the only way to properly transition to sustainability. 
So, um, for example, um, those that were directly opposed to diversification said it wasn't relevant to the defence sector. Like, the defence sector has to protect the nation. Um, if we try to do other jobs, we won't basically have defence, we'd lose our capabilities, we wouldn't be able to defend our interests at home and abroad, and that would render the nation mute, this person said. And um, the, the other one, kind of similarly, uh, you have to sh show the world that you can take them on, um, and it's kind of a display of power to have a strong military. I keep going quiet, but I keep having to move this. Um, part of the, the slide so that I can actually see the slide. Um, so others say that it would be difficult practically because um, it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't be economic because the standards for defence are really different. It has to be very very reliable. Um, quality is really important, whereas those sort of saying commercially. Um, that maybe not be the priority is more of getting things out quickly. So that was another reason they thought that. Um, those who were in that middle group, um, broadening defence to encompass civil, so that you, you don't diminish the defence sector, but you have more civil as well, um, operations from the same companies. Um, so people saying it's spreading the risk. Um, so you wouldn't you you don't you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket in case like the second speaker is saying the government's change and they have different priorities and suddenly you can find you haven't got so much business or work because they've got a different way of doing things. Um, but in another group uh, we're talking about imposing limits on arms production and sales. Um, so somebody said, well, do we actually need to make so many weapons do we need all of these um and one of them making the point how many times over do we have to be able to blow up the world to for it to kind of uh you know why why are we producing to that extent basically um and others are saying you know we could spend that money on other things um so uh it could be healthcare. it it could be um you know, even sustainability was mentioned. We could have great more green jobs. We could have um, actually tackle our environmental problems instead of spending so much on military. And uh, some actually did feel quite uncomfortable about their work. They said that they would ideally not want to be working in the defence sector because um, because of the impacts on the environment. Um, so. This uh, second speaker, for example, she said, I would be happy to lose this job and find another. And if it was in a renewable resource research or job, that would be fantastic. I would feel better about my life if I did that. Um, would I prefer to do something that was more relevant for the world? Absolutely. So she didn't feel like her work was relevant. So there were those stream of views as well. Um, in terms of the barriers that people saw, um, they said, that it would be actually difficult to diversify. Um, Decarbonisation is another question. People didn't see that as anywhere near so problematic. Um, but the kind of broader picture of diversification, which ultimately then will lead to de decarbonisation, is um, is more controversial. So they're saying, you know, people have these uh, secure jobs and it wouldn't... Um, it wouldn't be attractive to go to another job. And this person is saying people aren't as self selfless to walk away from this. And people said they get high wages um, and you know, you're know you not gonna get the same money in any, any other kind of industry. Um, and also people have an identity of um, being a defense sector worker that they feel that um, we have a, a, they have a pride in, um, defending the country they feel like they're ultimately saving lives and you know the environmental cost is some is a price that has to be paid for that so they don't they're not questioning it because it's very much a part of their identity and they think particularly with green jobs 
um, they're not very high status and they're not very high, uh, highly paid. Um, so that was a, a barrier. Another barrier they said was um, uh, the incentives. So the government um, is not kind of helping with any kind of diversification. Well, it's quite the opposite we've seen, haven't we, recently? Um, and they say there's always money available no matter what. Um, and so all the time that there's subsidi subsidies from the government and incentives from the government, the government really carrying a lot of the risk of um, being a defence sector company, then it's not that diversification is not going to happen. One of them said um, it's a, essentially state run, it's a state run industry. And a lot of the funding comes from the taxpayer, and the the, the uh, private companies are focused on short term reward, so they wouldn't want to kind of um, go for something more risky when they've got kind of an e easy income. So uh, the other one is the profit motive that people spoke about, saying it's very lucrative, um, and even going as far as saying that. You know, it's convenient for companies uh, to have wars. And so it kind of takes away the incentive to think about other ways of doing things. And they also talked quite a lot about the lobbying of the defence sector in relation to that. Um, how having these uh, nuclear weapons, for example, um, has given uh, power within the Security Council, um, how the lobbyists... Um, fund politicians in the United States are donated, donated to the parties. So it's like a, a massive kind of political barrier. So what, what are the solutions then, uh, given that um, people are seeing it in these different ways? So um, the workers, uh, again, said different things. Uh, so one of them said, um, if they could be earning uh, a sufficient um, profit in other sectors um, that, you know, there need to be more opportunities and more encouragement, more incentives is basically um, was this argument about the government incentives that needs to be allocated towards more green jobs. And then there would be the green jobs for people to move into. Um, uh, some one said that they could, for example, make it a requirement that a certain percentage of the money but spent on defence has some requirement to develop some of these greener technologies or to move away from fossil fuels. So that could be made as a priority. And then um, quite a lot of them spoke about uh, collective organising, that it's important to be in a union and to, um, to try and have some power within that because of the outsourcing, even if one country decides something, then it can all, the production can always be sent somewhere else. Um, so we have to have these kind of trade agreements, um, the idea where we can go ahead and transition, making something else when everything else is going out the door for the past 30 years. So all the other, especially in the United States, but really to a large extent in the UK, it's like the production, the, the, the productive jobs um, are no longer here. And yet yeah, they are still here with defence to a certain extent. Um, and also we need a new approach to foreign policy. Um, stop selling weapons, um, especially if they require fossil fuel. Um, and just think about living differently. Um, what we need is real human security. And um, we haven't got very long now, as uh, Finley said, really more 2030. Um, and yet we're still trying, for example, in the UK, this speaker's saying to um, to have a kind of imperialist, colonialist position of interfering in what's going on in the world and um, that it's going to be a threat for a global security. So, um, yeah, in general, decarbonisation, um, we need to think more broadly, I think, in terms of, diversification because it's not just a simple te technical answer as I think some of us have already said 
we have to think about the environmental impacts of the alternatives and the fact that we have multiple environmental crises. It's not just um, a climate change crisis. We also have a di biodiversity crisis. We have a human crisis in that um, large parts of the world still don't have enough to eat, don't have electricity, don't have clean water. Um, you know, if you take it in the wider context, then it's, you know, this is an opportunity to actually try to do some good in the world and to um, properly defend humanity, which is to make sure that our basic needs of survival are met. So for companies to set up structures and programs to include workers at all levels, we could only say a limited amount in terms of recommendations which is basically more around dialogue with the workers because they do have a lot of solutions. They do have a lot of thinking around um, these different issues. So we said for the unions that they should be discussing diversification uh, for governments to have a, a public dialogue on security policies. Again, the last the two speakers really kind of um, touched on that. Um, uh, what do we really mean by peace through strength and human security? These different kind of uh, aspects of this range of opinion on what defence really means. Let's have a public dialogue about that. And uh, for workers to um, propose diversification, education and dialogue in the companies and in the unions so that people understand what it means, the possibility, the uh, uh, possibilities and the threats, the potential threats, and uh, to, to have an informed idea of how they perceive that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for that, Karen. You, you raised some good points that kind of connect back to our previous speakers, but also to our final speaker. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very helpful. Thank you. And I think the points that you raised about the interviewees and, and their desire for a, a career path, that feels good to them. That relates to some of the points that you made, Duncan, about the talent retention. And actually, in terms of social mobility, didn't if people know that being an officer ranks as number one in the UK in terms of social mobility? So I think we really need to understand what is the benefit to the military community to help them understand how actually this is about their lives being better, good employment during and after service as well. So opportunity is the word of the day for this conference, I feel. But to come really back into military thinking, I think um, some key points that you spoke about there, um, it was about the pathways. How do we how do we force some of this through and, and force through some of the seriousness in an evidence-based way without breaking the structures that we all have? Just like in a university, we can't completely change parts of a service or parts of the MOD. We've got to work with the structures that we have that change the way that we do things. So that's a very difficult thing for any commander. But when you think that each force is kind of governed by its own Ministry of Defence, it makes it even harder. So I'm hoping our final speaker is going to be sharing some of his own perspectives on this um, and maybe help us all work through this a little bit. So our final speaker of the day is our the esteemed Vice Admiral Ben Beckering, who is currently working for the International Council for Climate Change and Security, but previously served in the Royal Netherlands Navy. So he's had, had held all sorts of posts over his career from staff officer, but moving through to naval staff, and he's conducted many deployments, including to countries which are currently suffering the effects of climate change now, including Somalia. So over to you, Admiral, to share some of your thoughts with us on decarbonizing from a military perspective. Yeah, th thank you very much. And it's it's been a real delight to be here today. Um, although I did feel out, feel a bit out, old out. Um, there are so many scholars and academics and scientists and techni technicians here that me with a very generalistically set brain, um, it's quite a challenge. But um, uh, to be honest, um, and there are even some people, and I take no offense whatsoever, who actually said that they knew exactly how military uh, were thinking. Uh, so that's interesting always to hear that uh, that others know how you think. Um, uh, but but I, I I hope to follow in the footsteps of um, of Captain Kirk. Uh, some of you may know that Star Trek. It was a, a story written by an Air Force officer in the United States Air Force who was in strategic command. So he's waiting with his finger at the button 
uh, for the nuclear weapons to go off. And he was so bored, he wrote his story, Star Trek, and decided that Captain Kirk should be a naval officer. Uh, because USS Enterprise always went boldly where no one had been before. So here I am. I follow in Captain Kirk's footsteps. Um, there has been some discussion about wouldn't it be better to have no war at all, therefore no military, and therefore eliminate uh, a huge part of the um, uh, of, the, of our problem. Uh, and I I would really cherish that moment, not because I'm retired now. I've always said that. I believe every organization should be as is first secondary aim to make itself completely unnecessary. Um, that's the only way that an organization can remain uh, sound and solid. Um, but uh, um, I always say on every question, can we can we eliminate the military? Can we opt to not to go to war at all anymore? It's always a question you, you should answer with yes, but it should be followed by what are the consequences? And, and there obviously are lots of consequences that come from a position that you don't have any military anymore. And therefore, as the Dutch Ministry of Defense slogan sounds, defend what is dear to us. Um, what has become clear in the Netherlands is that uh, climate change is, is dear to us, or the effects of climate change should be dear to us. So um, uh, I heard a lot of statements about the military young people were thinking. But I can cer certainly see in the last sort of five years that I've been involved in uh, the sort of defense, the military and climate change, a huge uh, rethinking within the defense organizations to tackle this problem, to at least to help out in tackling a huge problem, which is a problem for all of us. Um, and I'm not sure, but if you, uh, there was some discussion earlier on as well, whether climate change uh, leads to instability. Um, um, I cannot be absolutely sure about the, the chronology, chronology of things, but if you look at a rules-based international order, instability, uh, climate change, security issues, uh, scarcity of resources, then somewhere that is a cocktail that offers uh, lots, of lots of problems, and it still offers a lot of people because, mostly because of the lack of a rules-based international order to go their own way and not to go collectively in a certain direction. So that 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 as a sort of an introduction, um, uh, I'll quickly skip over. So oh, does this work or should? Okay, okay. I, I'll I'll basically slip over the top because I've sort of abbreviated it shortly in my introduction. But at the moment, what you see in the in the in the purple line that the military is being called upon to do a lot of things from crisis response all the way to the other end in uh, constabulary operations. Um, that, that makes it a hard challenge for the, for the military to be able to do everything. You, you basically become a jack, of, of, a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, uh, so even to become focused uh, on your own mission, wouldn't it be wonderful if all those instabilities, all these crises and conflicts coming from uh, climate change could be eliminated so we can focus on just defending the territory um, if the need comes? Um, I see four aspects where the military should invest in, uh, and they, you see them in the, in the blue boxes. It's first to inform uh, the debate. I think things have changed but certainly five six seven years ago i felt that the debate on climate change and security um was fought at the extremes by impolitely saying the tree huggers versus the deniers and the, the large quantity of people in the middle uh, were not really involved and engaged in the debate uh, i think the military uh, all militaries have a, a very sound intelligence community and they always look at sort of what is the next crisis and what does it mean for the military? How should we prepare? Uh, if they broaden their scope also to the, the real root causes and they'll include um, uh, climate change as well, uh, th then they can, with that information, inform a public debate. The second thing, and I think you mentioned it already, is license to operate, um, uh, to basically gain, this, the, to maintain the, the support of the government, the people, to do the things that you need to do. Uh, so you've, you've touched on that. The other one, and I, I stole the two lines, lessons to operate and in, 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 uh, freedom to maneuver from uh, Richard Nugy, uh, but freedom to maneuver is basically to, to gain advantage 
from uh, being uh, less reliant on dependent on carbon uh, fuels or fossil fuels. Uh, if you can achieve that, you you gain an enormous advantage over any adversar adversary, and it helps you to deter conflict because that's basically in the 40 years that I've been in uniform, it was not about me fighting a war gaining medals, but it was trying to keep the war out. Um, uh, and then the last thing is, all the, the military organizations are spending billions of euros. Um, uh, we can demand from industry and therefore direct industry to come up with, with can I say, green solutions. So that is certainly the, the four areas where I think we can contribute. Now, I, I stole this. No, I, I made this slide basically on the on the roadmap that the Netherlands Defense has been writing. And, and I see the green line going up is exactly what you warned us for. And obviously, the, the pivot point there in 2030 is the crucial one. Uh, and I, I get that completely. Uh, at the same time, this is I try to translate what they have said. And basically, uh, in the military, license to operate, freedom to maneuver, and inform the debate. From that comes the, the difficult balance that the military has to make between uh, remaining mission ready um, and on the other hand also becoming a responsible uh, contributor to uh, decarbonizing our society. Um, that means on the top end uh, to um, decrease the reliance on fossil fuels and at the bottom end try to feed it with uh, alternative sources. What is also seen as very important in the Netherlands defense organizations is to come up with a, a reporting system, accountability system that is fed into the general accountability system of the, uh, the armed forces so that we actually start to think about uh, and discuss really what is happening and what we can contribute. So this is the overall sort of the policy plot. Um, what I find interesting that they have said that if you if you can't decarbonize completely in 2015, 50, what is it then that we can uh, offset? Um, in the Netherlands, they look at sort of air, naval, uh, land, and uh, our installations, our barracks, our stations. Um, uh, and in the Netherlands, I've chosen really for to for, for new construction of bases. So every every barracks station, whatever is getting a complete revamp instead of sort of doing up existing buildings because the Netherlands thinks that will create much more uh, offset. The problem now in, in the Netherlands, small country, large amount of people. I think we are after the United States, the biggest meat exporter in the world, uh, which creates enormous uh, nitrogen de de deposit problems in the, in the Netherlands. And therefore all new construction is stopped. Uh, we can't build anymore. No roads, no buildings, etc. So it's a it's a huge discussion. So it's two or three minutes. Okay. So uh, come on, it's short. Uh, um, um, uh, so what what I've done is quickly try to translate in something that is more tangible. So how are we dealing? And what I took because of my own background, but also because uh, at the moment in the Netherlands investments, uh, the Navy is it, it's the Navy's turn. The Air Force has replaced everything. Now it's the Navy's turn. And then afterwards, the Army gets re replacements again. And I've looked at uh, naval propulsion because obviously uh, naval um, use of uh, fossil fuels is about 26% of the total we do in, in the Netherlands. So if you can sort of um, green your, your propulsion systems, um, that, then uh, you are making strides. I think this program basically looks at the timeline but but they don't look at 2030, 2050, but what is available on the technology market that we can use now? And that's the TRLs, the technology um, um, no, maturity levels. Um, and, and, and what you see there on the top left is a, a hull vein of a, on a ship the size of a frigate, which we can lower a, a sort of spoiler, underwater spoiler. Uh, and depending on the speed, that will create sort of between 15 and 20 percent of uh, less fuel consumption. It is an exi existing platform. And that's always the problem with defense. You have an existing problem. How can you make that more fuel efficient? Because it's going to be there for another 20 years. So this is being installed. And that's the, the solid green dot there being installed at the ship at the moment, the first of, first of class. 
Um, but there's also a look at alternative fuels, and we are uh, the, the Navy is um, introducing a set of eight um, uh, auxiliary vessels, 800 to 1,000 tons, so about 60 meters long. Uh, and there we go for um, a methanol uh, propulsion because that came out as the best possible. Uh, but the ship is designed to switch over as soon as possible uh, to hydrogen uh, uh, propulsion. Um, the, the problem is that it's not at a maturity level, as you can see in the, in the, in the slide, uh, that we can do it now as we are building the ships. So, yeah, one minute. Um, uh, th there's th Then there's the new class of frigates. So why don't we do something similar there? Um, the problem for a frigate-sized ship is if you just construct a ship and you look at the propulsion, with the propulsion, the, so the, the energy source comes the generator and then most importantly, the gearbox. And that those three items create the, the spine of a ship. Uh, you you can't say well let's let's remove the diesel engines and install a small nuclear re reactor because it will have immense impact on the generators and the gearbox. So you're basically stuck with a ship design for a long time. Um, they looked at it. Uh, nuclear is is at a certain uh, maturity level globally, but we don't think we can uh, introduce it into ships uh, anywhere soon. So it's it's way back there. So. What, and that's my concluding remark. The Navy can't do it on its own. Um, uh, 20, 30 years of budget cuts and slimming down. We basically done away with a lot of our research people and engineers, etc. So we really have to now hold hands with industry uh, and everybody else in a, a sort of an ecosystem. We call it the maritime ecosystem to materialize these. And, and I think in the Netherlands, we're fortunate. Uh, the port of Rotterdam has the ambition to become the greenest port soon uh, in, uh, globally. Uh, and we have Marin, an in, a research institute that wants to deliver uh, a fossil free, uh, fuel free propulsion for uh, larger ships soon. So to, to hook up with them, with our research establishments, our industry and the user, the Navy, uh, we I think the, the ambition is to create um, earlier rather than later uh, some real main uh, differences. So that's, I think how the, the problem is being tackled. I thank you. Thank you. So again, we've had lots of great points in there from all of our speakers. And but I think one of the key takeaways before we go to question time, just giving you all the time to prepare your questions, is this idea of the intelligence communities to an extent. I feel like climate security and climate intelligence is very much growing in the defense sector. Um, that I, didn't, I personally didn't hear that a few years ago. Maybe that was more in defense before I was in it. But that's um, a new development that I've really seen. And it's to me, it, it's defense is finally in our culture. We're showing that this is what we've always done. We look back on historical wars. Defense has always looked at environment. It's always adapted its platforms, its technologies, and its fuels to the current market or the environments it will operate in. But the net zero and, and the climate change debate feels very civilian and separate at times. And it's it's been quite a long journey to kind of mesh those things together so we can get to a point where someone gives us good results that we can just kind of capture them and insert them into the defence model. And that's where I've seen a really big gap for the last few years. And it comes down to Finley's point as well about prepare for, for the worst and don't assume the best. And that was actually one of the outcomes of the Chilcot report for, um, from the Ministry of Defence following the Iraq war. The UK needs to have better foresight. And for me, this is about that foresight. It's understanding what is our future operating environment? What are the variables that are going to constrain how we fight? And then how do we mitigate and adapt and make sure we get there? So I've been really glad in this conference to hear this language of mitigation pulling out because it feels like we're starting to get a little bit closer together. I hope that that's a takeaway you guys have all taken from this as well. It definitely feels like we're moving forward a little bit and getting close to the point where we can start to try and put things in place rather than having our ideas in our conversations. So thank you for you guys for kind of pulling all that together. It's been a really good conversation. And thank you to Karen online as well. But conscious that we've got 20 minutes left, I'm sure it's nearly beer a quote for lots of people. Let's go to question time. So we're going to do one at a time, memory issues. If you can please <laughs> say your name and where you work just to help us all, that'd be great. And we'll go to the back first, sir. I, um... Well, maybe more of a comment, but it was sort of a theme that's streaming along Benjamin and I, Mark, uh, Queen Mary. Um, 
One of the themes I think that came out across this panel, and you can comment on it or not, but particularly at the end, with Ben sort of your exclamation point on it. Um, I guess there's not one just singular military, right? Not one singular military person that will make the military or and or the military itself and or the commercial sector, right? If you're gonna study the military, no military, you might as well start looking at private industry, right? More and more. And and, and having said that, particularly with the sort of diversity that Karen brought in, the multiple perspectives that those who are now encapsulated within a kind of military uh, world or ecosystem or however it is you want to encapsulate it, um, might have. I mean, I think we need to keep that in mind. This monolithic military just doesn't fit. And we need to be careful as researchers moving forward in terms of, of studying that. Just a thought if you want to comment on it. If not, we can move on. It's probably not a lot of I would personally agree that uh, identifying the specific office you need will often get much better results in terms of conversation or impact. It helps a lot as researchers. I, I have personally learned through experience um, that if I just say defence and I'm not specific, I can find out quite quickly publicly that I've missed a lot of their stuff. So I, I will share my experience and hope that it saves someone else there. But do any, any of panellists have anything to add on this? Agree. Yeah, no, great. I mean, I, I, I think you've summed up what were the real challenges of researching the military um, and, yeah. and how you also take an international perspective on this because, you know, there's... <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, and exactly. There's a, maybe, if, if I may, um, I had a discussion once with a, um, uh, a French lawyer who worked for himself in Brussels uh, and he was talking about deep state. And I said, well, deep state, that's something... Rumsfeld and Cheney and Blackwater and Halliburton, he said, oh, that's, that's kindergarten. Um, you come to France, he said. Uh, there they are in the same uh, cult together. So high political, high military. Uh, and then I asked him, so so how, how about the Netherlands? He said, no, you guys know. So we're, we're to, to cooperate very closely in a, in a maritime ecosystem as we do in the Netherlands is far less risky then uh, and no, not risky, but it's 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 it it ha doesn't have the same impact as what you can see already in this in these big big industrial conglomerates in other countries and bigger countries which which have uh, who have far more strategic interests. So there you you have to be even more cautious, I think, than in the smaller countries. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm just uh, I just want to be cautious in terms of like sort of mobilizing this term deep state by which <laughs> right. But, the American sort of way in which it is mobilized by yeah. like, no, no. far right political movement. But true, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but but it's it's the industrial yeah. complex. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. I think you've just proved the difficulty of the conversation <laughs> yeah. in international conversation and actually between academics and industry and defense. We all use slightly different languages, whether it's because of our, where we work or where we live. And that's the one thing we really always need to be conscious of when we come together to an extent. So it's a great point. A reminder to all of us that we need to get better at signposting to those things. So thank you. And to you, sir. Yeah, um, Sam Perlow Freeman from the Campaign Against Arms Trade. Um, really fascinating day, and thanks to everyone who's been organising it and speaking. So, one thing I've sort of been taking from what Finley in particular has been saying is there's limits to technological solutions. Um, we, uh, I'm feeling after hearing that I'm feeling really bad about my Italian holiday coming up, which involves flying there and back, but. Um, at least I'm sustaining some aviation industry employment, but uh, <laughs> um, we'd like to think it can all be decarbonized, but yeah, technology not there, not going to be there in time. And you, you know, this is going to apply to a lot of the military operations and capability and equipment that we're talking about. And another thread that's sort of been in the background occasionally popping up is. Are we talking about having the same amount of military stuff or even more doing the same amount of military things, but without the carbon? Or are we talking about doing, you know, having less military? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to frame it in terms of let's get rid of the military overnight. You know, in 2050, there are almost certainly still going to be militaries in the world. But what does 
strike me is that the, the question that's ob often absent is, yes, maybe we can reduce the intent carbon intensity of military activity and warfare, but do we need to also work on the demand side? And if the military is brought into international climate negotiations, then does demand how much we're doing of these military operations need to be brought in to those to that to that conversation? The thing that struck me is when we're thinking about 2050 about decarbonizing and the path and how do we keep our military just as strong while we decarbonize. And we're imagining a world where humanity has solved one of the most difficult international cooperation problems there is of getting all, all that um, those CO2 emissions down collaboratively, but is still in a position of multiple camps armed to the teeth, ready to fight each other should it be necessary. And this is a sort of, this strikes me as a bit of a contradictory world that we're imagining. So, you know, the US and China, for example, between the more than half the military spending, really don't want to go and walk to war, but as, as both assuming they both need to increase their strength, increase their technology, increase their amount of military stuff to be prepared for that. And that doesn't strike me as consistent with a net zero 2050 if that dynamic changes. So this has been all commented too long, but I suppose my question is, <laughs> are there ways of bringing the question of the demand of how much military the world needs into the equation of climate negotiations? And can we get to where we need to be without doing that? Yeah. Well, I think you, you sort of answered this question by saying well, the, the first thing should be preventing. The best way to reduce military emissions is less conflict and less military activity. Um, and then you want to look at the demand drivers of conflict. And I think we were all sort of talking about those when you identified water scarcity and food scarcity. And then that's why I was identifying the energy requirements and the land and the water requirements of these solutions. So that's kind of the main point I wanted to drive home with my presentation is the so-called so solutions that we're proposing to reduce the emissions are, are literally some of the things that will be the biggest drivers, in my opinion, of um, of climate change and therefore increased conflict. So we are we are in a, a position. Uh, my my analysis of the COP process in general is we're more scared of each other than we are of the the global problem. Um, and until we can learn to actually say, and I've seen that in my industry, is we. We talk in certain ways about China um, and not about other countries and Russia. We need to be able to resolve those differences if we're going to be able to resolve the climate crisis. Um, and the way of not doing that is doubling down and saying, well, let's just steal all of the maximized resource that's ours and defend it. It has to be how can we share, which is the the question of our generation. Yeah. yeah if, if I may, may add, and I think James Clare earlier in this chair, mentioned it it starts with diplomacy in development and then defense and um if we find a way that diplomacy can actually use uh, a, a globally agreed uh, rule of law then 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 that will be a first very important significant step to come down to reduction but but it it really is we're depending on that and and i'm uh, the, the pointers do not uh, point in a, a positive direction for me at the moment yeah. And Karen's got a hand up. Uh, if we could just have the audio for Karen for her to respond, please. Okay. Yeah, so we need to like um, eliminate the causes of war because at the moment we're not really understanding what the causes of war are. We're very often told that we're having this war because some crazy person has decided they want to get their hands on the world. And you know, it's the same story over and over. We're not looking at the actual causes. And there have been academic studies of the causes, um, and one of them happens to be the military build-up is often a cause. Um, the, the, the country where the military build-up is surrounding them feels threatened, and so then things begin to get very tense, and it's not possible to discuss anything. So 
you know, where is this huge investment in the alternatives of finding, eliminating the actual causes of war? And then we wouldn't be in this situation because I think when we've got a multi, all these multiple crises, we need to think about, you know, what is actually socially useful production in this situation? Is it really useful for us to be producing certain things? And this is clearly an area where there could be an alternative. If we can eliminate these causes of war, then we can, um, you know, it's not just an idealistic thing. Yes, nobody wants war, but we have to do this. If actually your approach to avoiding war is to create more weapons, that's that's not, well, it's arguable, but that has been one of the causes of war. Government have been really very sensitive right now. Just to push back, I would argue that the decision to go to war is a whole government decision. That's people within the MOD, particularly personnel, just go and, and act as cause. So we maybe need to think about where do we have this conversation in a, in a wider place because people in defence might not be able to come forward with the solutions that as academics we might we might want and need. Um, but I'm just going to go to one question online, then we've got one in the room as we're we'll coming to the end of our time. But we've got Daniel, Hel Daniel Hellman online, who's from Warford College, and he had a question for Finlay. Um, and he asked if you've got any data on algae sourced aeroplane fuels, um, if you could discuss anything about that, please. <laughs> uh, my data is it's been discussed since the mid 2000s. Um, Exxon Mobil and BP have invested many hundreds of millions in it um, and have not been able to prove that you get more energy out than you put in. Um, so to talk about there's often a lot of water requirements as well as energy. There's discussion about putting it and, and getting away from land use by putting it over the sea. Um, it, the difficulties of doing all of that, of cleaning the algae, there's loads of specific reasons that mean that it's not gone up those TRL levels. Um, and the burden of proof is on the developer to show um, that they can actually do that. So um, it's a nice idea in theory, but the practice has not demonstrated itself. To, we can't, Again, we should assume the worst with it um, and, until it shows that it can produce a million tonnes of fuel at a, at a cost competitive level. And I mean, this almost brings us to, to the whole point of, of today, really, isn't it? How do we get through this? If if, if we think of, of digital or AI to kind of bring us out of our field, we know that policy and governance can't keep up with that pace. And it's the same here. And de defence is, is also separate from policy. So we've never had this much data, information, technologies, but we've got to make sense of it in the defence terms and get all those processes right and make sure we're informed by evidence, not what just sounds really good at the time, and move forward. And that's the problem we've got with pace as well, because we need to pick up the pace, but we also need to get it right before we can have that upscale. And that's, I think, where there's a real tension here. But also, again, opportunity. It's the end of the day, and it is an opportunity. We have got things we can move forward with, and we're getting there. But again, time. So have we got one, maybe two more questions in the room? So. Hi, uh, Sam Thomas, PwC. Um, so very recently, the Ajax tank, light tank, has sort of just got that active service off and originally being commissioned about 12 years ago. So there's obviously a, a 10 year technology process. And um, I'm interested to hear how the panel think the military can engage better with the private sector to spur on innovation and what they think that relationship should look like. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. No. 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 It's. It's. It. Uh, th this is a subject close to my heart, and it's in the Netherlands is the um, the maritime e ecosystem. If I can talk for the navy, because in the Netherlands you don't find any OEM original equipment manufacturer on the air side and the land side anymore, the heavy systems, but you do still find one or a, a group that that is on in the maritime side, and it's the the close cooperation between uh, the user, the Navy, uh, research institutes, and there's three or four big ones, uh, and the industry that actually, what is it that we need? What is the technology at hand? And what can we build? And that has created uh, uh, what, what I always say, an almost a knowledge engine that produces on every sort of every eight to 10 years, a new class of ship and ships, and then you can build on. That, that circle was almost broken about 15 years ago because of the budget cuts. And then you see when you now want to restart it again, uh, yeah, you have to come from far. Uh, what the research institutes and the industry are now doing is trying to 
hook on also the startups uh, and come up with uh, and also old ones out like the port of, port of Rotterdam to hook on hook in as well. So there's a lot of things. It 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 requires a lot of work. And and one thing that the defense organizations don't have is a lot of people hands uh, because that they have all been reduced. So it it makes it difficult to have level partners talking to each other. So there's all kinds of challenges, but at least people, what I see people are trying to to pick it up again and then to make that work. Uh, and I think a lot of countries will have similar situations. Uh, and I've got three speakers left, so I'm gonna challenge you all. This is an elevator pitch for your answer. You've got one minute each. So Duncan, you're noticing the firing line? On on this question. If you, if you feel yeah. you can answer this. Yeah, one. no, I mean, I, I just wanted to add that it's quite interesting in the discussions that we've had with defense industry, um, that the defense industry is experiencing <laughs> independent pressures to to decarbonize, let alone what, what the military is asking them to do, because they're in a war for talent as well. They have their own sort of issues with actually raising investment and, and, and getting the money to do things. So um, in, in, in that sense, the, the, there's also this interesting tension that if, if defense industry has to move before the military is is actually ready, the military is going to be finding itself uh, chasing after where defense industry is going. So so these two things are very closely connected, in it, but it's not just a one way relationship of industry waiting for defense to tell it what it wants. Um, industry may be forced to move before 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 the military is ready. Thank you. Finn? Um, so I think yeah. A lot of what I presented is actually like in direct opposition to what the industry would tell you. So if you get someone from the aviation industry in, they will say like almost the polar opposite of me. The solution is sustainable aviation fuels, offsetting works, e-fuels, all of that stuff. And that's because you've got to think about their self-interest. They are not looking at long-term risks. They're looking at short-term growth to drive share price for shareholders. Equally, you know, if you're in the military, you're also kind of dealing with the political world, the general election in a year. Can we reduce costs this year, not worry about 10 years? So there's actually, I think there's a role to push back on the corporate greenwash. And they, there needs to be a time horizon with defense and security that's looking over 10, 20 years and critically examining what these corporations are saying and deciding what's in the best interests of citizens, um, not big business. That's, that's why I... I really cherish this this third partner in the equation in an end, and that's the the research institutes and there the University of Delft and there's Marin and TNO, so well respected uh, and having to have them on the table as well takes a bit of this greenwashing away. Yeah, just be careful who's funding research, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And let's go to Karen as well. Who's in, in, I'm sure you've got some good insights for us on this one. Um. In relation to that question, I don't think I heard it. Could you repeat the question? Because sure, I can't sure. really hear the Could audience very well. Yeah, can you hear Karen? Yeah, just about. I was, I was just asking uh, what uh, can be done between military and private uh, enterprise in order to engender more innovation. Um. I don't know. That's not my area. <laughs> I'm not um, somebody who works on innovation. Uh, you know, I think we need to be thinking about the wider picture of how we're going to make the transition to sustainability safe for everybody, that people feel like they can make that transition, that there's going to be alternative jobs for them. There's going to be other ways of making money, other kinds of businesses. So I suppose, yeah, it is about innovation in that sense. Um, yeah, so it, it's just allowing, um, and really allowing other things to happen because <laughs> a lot of the time it's, it's not possible because of these barriers that people talked about, because at the moment you can't, you, you can't make a profit from suggesting that we need to have less wars, <laughs> you know, so that kind of innovation I'm interested in is kind of social innovation. Thank you to our panelists. Let's give this panel a round of applause. Before we to Ellie to just finish off the day, let's just give a big round of applause to CEOs as well for organising this and giving us the chance to do it.
Uh, yeah, just to very much repeat, and I, I know you have to head off as well, so feel free to, to make a move. Um, but yeah, just a massive thank you to this panel, all the panels before, and everyone who so wonderfully chaired the panels. You can ask for another round of applause, you can if you want. <laughs> uh, to all of you attendees as well, and that's those online and those in the room for your diversity and passion. I think it's probably a, a, something that's come across today, and I think that's been really interesting mix to have in the room. Uh, and also thank you for bearing with us through the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you also to everyone who's managed the technical difficulties. Yeah, and everyone else who's involved in pulling this together, a big old thank you. Uh, a few final things to ask of you all. Uh, there will be a survey, which we'll get up on there. Um, which is just to help us see how you found today and also plan for future events. Um, in regards to future events, if you do want to keep in touch with us uh, to find out what else we're up to, you can follow us on Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days at <laughs> Mill Emissions Gap. Um, but also, I think all of you will have received an email from me at some point, so feel free to just drop me an email and say hello. Uh, that also includes if you wanted to be added to our mailing list as well. Uh, recordings are hopefully <laughs> should be available at some point. We'll pop those up on YouTube and let you know that they're up, uh, which will, uh, yeah, should you want to revisit the day uh, and also <laughs> um, share with any colleagues. Uh, and lastly, although we are packing down, <laughs> we do have the room for another 45 minutes. So those of you who are physically here in Oxford, um, please do stay, make use of the room, talk to each other as we have been all day. There's, I think, some more refreshments that come. Uh, yeah, so thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>